Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the podcast. Hello, listener. Thanks for joining us. I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dot. And this week, Coco, what are we talking about? We just freshly watched something. And what was it? We just watched the hot off the presses, The Trial of the Chicago 7, a brand new, just released today, Netflix release. If you weren't alive in the 60s, or if you haven't studied a lot of American history. It's the based on a true story written and directed by Aaron Sorkin of the riots in Chicago during the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Uh, It was just kind of a crap fest. There was lots of (laughs) violence. And in 1969, the federal government tried seven people. Well, Eight, technically, I guess, mm-hmm. although he was denied counsel, and that's a separate story, for inciting riots. Mm-hmm. It stars Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Frank Langella, Eddie Redmayne, Michael Keaton, Mark Ryland, Sasha Baron Cohen. I know there's other big names that I'm completely forgetting. It was an Mark A+. Mark Rylance. Plus. Yeah, I said him. Uh, it was an A-plus cast. Um, just the story of the trial, all the shenanigans that happened at the trial, there were words on the screen at the end of the movie talking about what happened to the main guys after the trial. Mm-hmm. So it's two hours and 10 minutes, like I said, written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. So you know that the dialogue is going to be snappy. Mm-hmm. Daltz, what'd you think? Also, Mark Rylance was in it. Did I mention that? <laughs> I think I've heard of him. Is he new on the scene? He's Mark Rylance, yeah. Okay. He's a new guy. I uh, So I'm a huge Aaron Sorkin fan, I have to admit. I loved uh, The Social Network. I loved The Newsroom, which was a show that he wrote. He's got some major writing chops. As anybody who, have, who has seen anything that he's done, he's got the witty banter. He's got the intelligent conversation. He's got the people who are engaged and smart and funny. And... Uh, I uh, so I'm a really big fan of his. He's he's got a lot of good stuff in his uh, in his repertoire that he's done. Um, this one for me was pretty good. I mean, I was expecting more because it was an Aaron Sorkin written and directed production. Uh, he also did that for Molly's Game, which was uh, something we saw not all that long ago. Um, and it was the same sort of thing to me. I, I think that he's better when he does the writing and less so the writing and the directing. Um, but I thought this was really well done. The acting was really good. I thought the uh, storyline was pretty good. The the thing that uh, about this is that the shenanigans that the judge, uh, who was pranked by, uh, played by Frank Langella, who was who was always great as a hateful character. Whenever he's in a movie, you, you just want to hate him. He, um, he's really good at playing a holes. He is, and he did a great job in this again as that very same role. And then in the research notes that we uh, reviewed before this podcast. Uh, <laughs> You know, very carefully put together by our research team. Um, AKA they met- Wikipedia. <laughs> Shh, don't, don't reveal our secrets. I think listener knows our secrets by now. Um, and he, uh, the judge, actually was as big an a hole as he is portrayed in the movie. So a lot of these movies, when they are dramatic uh, recreations of historical events, as listener knows, there there's a lot of fudgy playing with the facts kind of thing. This is not uh, unique in that regard. However, the judge is is pretty much the a-hole that he was portrayed as. So that was uh, interesting to me and also a very interesting uh, plot driver. And we should say that this is a courtroom drama. Like there are scenes where, um, uh, you know, the riots, there's flashback to the riots and the setup and, and dramatic scenes and that sort of thing. But this is essentially a courtroom drama. So if you're down with that kind of thing, I think you'll find it very interesting. If you're going to watch a courtroom drama and Aaron Sorkin is the writer, then that's probably a pretty good safe bet. It's not mm-hmm. like it's Law and Order or something like that. Don't be dissing Law and Order. It's not like the last half of the dun-dun and then all of a sudden <laughs> there's a verdict that you completely saw coming. Um, this one uh, is is a little bit more compelling. So I've now talked for 45 minutes, Coco. What is your opinion of the... What's the name of this thing again? The Trial of the Chicago 7? Yeah, I think so. Did I get that wrong? Oh, I don't know. Did I misread the, the research cue cards? notes when 
when I did the summary. I don't uh, think you did. Um, yeah, I liked it. I actually enjoyed Aaron Sorkin's direction. Oh. Um, I thought he was better at this than he was at Molly's Game, which I actually don't remember him directing. Um, and that starred Idris Elba, so you know. Well. Right, I mean, that's high praise. But, that's one um, of your top five. Right, but I, I As liked it. you're constantly it. reminding me. <laughs> you, the, the picture above the bed gave it away. <laughs> like. <laughs> and in the bathroom <laughs> and in some of the kitchen cabinets <laughs> in the bottom of my water glasses I, we should talk about that off air <laughs> the bottom of your water glasses <laughs> yeah. so that's why there's a the guy in the bottom of my cereal bowl every now and then um yeah i actually i thought he did a good job of directing there were a lot of scenes where they would be telling like testimony they would be telling a story of what happened but he would cut between the testimony and and showing the actors portraying the event, and then also showing Sasha Baron Cohen as Abby Hoffman, yeah. who apparently did stand up during the trial to try to make some money or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. And he would be telling the story to his stand up audience at the same time. So there were a few scenes where it would cut between those three scenes as they were narrating an event, and I thought that was really good. Yeah, um, I did too. The cast, like I said, was just first rate. I mean, you can't have that many A-list capable actors in one movie without it being really good. Right, um, and everybody was on their game too. Yeah, everybody was really on their game. Frank Langella, actually, normally he's such just like a balls-to-the-wall a-hole in every movie that I'm just like, oh, here comes Frank Langella again. <laughs> but even though he was an a-hole in this movie... I, I don't want to say it was shaded because it wasn't, but it just, it felt like there were more, he had more to do than just be an a-hole. Right. Like he was an a-hole, but there, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but just, I, I liked him more in this movie, even though I hated the character mm-hmm. than I have in some other movies where all he does is just be nefarious. You liked his performance as the a-hole, as said a-hole. Yeah. And, and like I was saying earlier, I think is that he really drove the story a lot. Whereas yeah. I think in some of the other movies that he's been the a-hole, he's been just kind of like the the you know the background a hole or yeah. the the wallflower a hole whereas in this right. one he was he was the center of conflict right like it wasn't really in a, in a courtroom drama usually it's the defense and the prosecution you know mm-hmm. they're they're the ones that are going back and forth and battling but it was actually the defense and the judge in this case and like I said off the top this is accurate I mean his his the judge's uh, uh, portrayal is very accurate in terms of his behavior, which is really depressing in in many many ways. Yeah, there there was a uh, so I've you know I I was born after 1968. What? <laughs> I was born before 1968. That is why you bought me actually because I was born after 1968. <laughs> so I I did a little bit of learning about the 68. Democratic convention in history, but we didn't really learn about, you know, the trial, obviously, afterwards mm-hmm. or anything, because by the time I was in school, we just kind of whipped through the 60s really fast. <laughs> um, like, history just kind of ended with World War II when I was in school. Yeah, nothing so, of significance happened in the well, 60s. Well, I mean, you know, we learned about JFK's assassination, and we learned about Vietnam, but, right. you know, and Watergate, but, you know, some other stuff. It, it was just very much kind of like, okay, let's get past, let, let's throw this major stuff in that we have to throw in and because mm-hmm. and, we're running up to the end of the semester. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't know about this trial. Um, I didn't, I mean, you could see that they were going to be found guilty coming a mile away because of all the shenanigans, like we said, but I was really happy that their um, guilty verdict got reversed on appeal mm-hmm. as it should have been right. because <laughs> there were <laughs> numerous things that I, as you know, my legal knowledge extends to law and order <laughs> there were numerous things i could see that i was like "Ooh, that should be reversed on appeal because yeah. that was clearly <laughs> yeah and me extra too extra judicial you know <laughs> me too I, like my my legal expertise is limited to uh essentially john grisham novels <laughs> Ooh. so well I, and also i covered court years and years ago but that wasn't in this country and you watched do south so that's and I, <laughs> So, <laughs> which is like law and order, really? Right, dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm from Canada. There's not really a need for you know courts or right or I anything mean, like that because people are so honest up there. It's like, yeah, geez, I did it. Eh? <laughs> I, sorry about that. Eh? <laughs> sorry, I threw that Molotov cocktail. Eh? <laughs> well, I won't do it again. <laughs> they call it a Molson cocktail up there. Though. <laughs> a Molson cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> There's no need for courts in Canada. Everybody's just so honest. Oh, geez, I jaywalked. Okay, uh, here's my here's my twenty dollar fine. <laughs> but I, even I noticed uh, a lot of that same thing. Like you said, uh, 
you know, he's denying uh, denying objections left, right, and center. And then at one point, he denied an object or sustained an objection and that hadn't that, even been raised. Right. And uh, I, I just the thing that really rankles me the most in life, and this is a very deep part of the podcast, listener. So if you wanted to go and go to the bathroom or something, but what I what really rankles me the most is injustice in the world and seeing that injustice in the movie the way it was portrayed. Like I just my blood was boiling. Like Bobby Seal's character, who was not considered one of the Chicago Seven, he was the Black Panther who was somehow looped into all this, even though he was never at the scene and he was only in Chicago for four hours. All of a sudden, he's part of this conspiracy. And the all these guys and all these characters from various walks of life being brought together and, and co-accused of starting this riot... It just makes me, it had a lot of relevance today. It, there was a lot of, even though this movie, like from doing the, looking at the research from our crack research team, uh, this started in 2007. The story was uh, originally Steven Spielberg wanted to make a movie on this, uh, on the trial after the Democratic uh, Convention riots. And it went to Sorkin to write, and it got back, and it tossed back and forth, and eventually, and various people were connected to it. Uh, various, you know, like Will Smith at one point was going to play Bobby Seal. Oh wow! So there were all all sorts of characters and, and actors in there, but uh, it got kicked around a lot. And then a year and a half ago, Aaron Sorkin said, oh, "I think it's time to bring this back," and he dove right back into it. And now, as a writer and director, he can do that sort of thing. Whereas previously, he was involved just as the writer writing for Steven Spielberg. Um, it's a long way of saying that the delay might have actually happened, you know, and, and been fortunate because mm-hmm. this is really relevant today when you've got right. the courts in some ways working against the people and and police and the police. The police yeah. in this were not portrayed in a, in a shiny, happy uh, kind of light as they should not have been in that situation. <laughs> absolutely. So um, there's a lot of things moving around that even though they happened in 1968, are still sadly relevant today in 2020. Yeah, like the more things change, the more they stay the same. You've still got a police state. You've still got courts that are stacked against anybody who wants to change the system. Right. Like, you know, you it's exactly got, the right movie for 2020. And you've still got systemic racism. Right. And you've still got uh, the rich, uh, you know, victoring over the over the poor and that sort of thing. And you've still got malevolent people in power. It's just that in the Nixon administration, they were malevolent and smart. And today they're malevolent and dumb. So, right. <laughs> you know, but malevolence still remains. So. Right. There's a, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of relevance in this movie that uh, you wouldn't think. I mean, and I say that because yeah, sure. A lot of movies are sort of correlations, and they're uh, made to be uh, allegories and that sort of thing for past crimes and that sort of thing. But in, it, the movie was made essentially in 2018 and 19 before we got to where we are now, and yet it's relevant. And it was written back in 2007, and I'm mm-hmm. sure redrafted many times. Um, but it just shows that you know, 20 years, uh, it's 13 years, I guess we're talking uh, between start and finish of this, and it's still sadly relevant today and Aaron Sorkin didn't even have to change a lot in this like he's I think in the social network he played kind of fast and loose with some of the facts but in this like there were some things he changed but it seemed as though by and large he didn't just wholesale create a whole new story for dramatic effect like 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 we've been saying the the judge he didn't have to make any of that up. Like right. the judge was just crazy, and <laughs> right, yeah. So and not uh, judicious either. Like right. and and some of the things that he did mess with a little bit were sort of the chronology of events. So certain things happened. You know, there was a speech, and then there was this, and then there was that. So the shackling of of Bobby Seal happened. Uh, at a certain time in the trial that was not the same time in right. the movie. Um, so, like for example. Uh, to follow that up is Bobby Seal met, stood up and told the judge, you know, F you and all that sort of stuff. Um, that didn't really happen. And it wasn't the launching point for the shackling. It was just sort of a mundane, just another contempt of court charge mm-hmm. that got him shackled. And re- regardless, I don't think it changed the characterization or the, right. or the, you know, the portrayal of this event. I think it, in some ways you see some of those other movies and you're like, that's not the way it happened at all. And it, it, throws you off whereas in this case having read the research notes quite closely 
<laughs> I didn't think that it actually messed with the mojo of this movie. The, the, right. Largely, it came across as the way it happened to me, and it was characterized in the in the injustice and all that sort of stuff. Right, and apparently Joseph uh, Gordon-Levitt's character, who was one of the prosecutors, right. he he was made to be a bit more sympathetic than he should have been. Like in the beginning of the movie, he's like, I don't think we should try these guys right. because the previous administration said there was no basis for it and we're just going to give rise to all these people now angry that we're doing this. And apparently in real life that didn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. But I was expecting his objection to show up more throughout the movie. Like maybe he would do a little bit of sympathetic questioning of witnesses, Mm -hmm. which he didn't really do. And he didn't have to do it anyways because the judge was basically throwing the case to them. Mm -hmm. But so... I don't, I don't know what the point of that was, actually. And then at the end, he stood up when Eddie Redmayne's character was reading the 5,000 names of Vietnam dead mm-hmm. for the allocution statement. So, you know, it was just little kind of ticky-tack stuff like that. Like, one person, like, punched a bailiff, but it was actually another person. Right. So, it, yeah. you know, it was, yeah. by and large, it seemed like it was fairly true to the actual facts. Right. With, and with some changes here and there. And there were some quotes that were attributed to different characters right. in the movie, but they were actually said. It was just by mm-hmm. a different person. So, I, I don't really have a problem with that. Yeah. Um, what we, I was expecting George, Joseph Gordon-Levitt to do at some point was to put everybody into a dream state and then float above the court like he did in Inception, and then, you know, swim around the air like he does. So that's what Eddie Redmayne was talking about when he was talking about levitating the Pentagon. Right. Like, he he must have known about Inception in 1969. That's what I was... Every time I see Joseph Gordon Gordon Levitt, I can never say his name, (laughs) I think of that. I also think of Brick. He was really good in Brick. I never saw Brick. Um, So overall, Coco, uh, any other thoughts on this this very serious movie? It's hard to, you know, poke fun at a movie like this, but uh, it was worthwhile uh, viewing, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. It's, like I said, it's two hours and ten minutes. It's very well paced. I never felt like it was draggy at all. No. There were a couple scenes where I had to get up and leave and Dalton would be like, do you want me to pause it? I'm like, no, let's get to the end of this scene because I wanted to see it. So it held my attention throughout. Yeah, the pacing was good. It was interesting. The cast was first rate. Yeah, I'd I'd give it high marks. I think you should I think you should spend a couple hours watching it, especially if you happen to be like us and today was just like rainy and awful <laughs> and you're kind of trapped inside and you don't have anything to do unlike every other day during a pandemic. <laughs> so yeah, I would give it probably one and three quarter gavels up. Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. I, I didn't think it was as sharp as, as Aaron Sorkin can be. Like I mentioned off the top, I thought the dialogue was, was pretty good, but he set such a high bar mm-hmm. for his, his dialogue in, in previous movies that I, uh, I was left wanting a little bit. Um, and some of the stuff became a little bit uh, expected. But really, overall, these are really minor uh, criticisms because I think overall it was very compelling. Like you said, it wasn't very long. I'm all, out, I'm all about watching something that's you know two hours and you're done pretty much. Like yeah. a, a two hours and change. <laughs> like those days of watching eight, ten episodes for something, I just the investment there is not paying off for me. Right now, we are watching Des, which is a brand new release on Sundance Now. Mm -hmm. It's only three episodes, two and a half hours long total. So that's right in Dalt's wheelhouse. Exactly. Even even though it's about a serial killer. A British serial killer. A British serial killer. So (laughs) watch for that podcast coming as soon as the final episode of that is released. Coming soon to a podcast near you. I two uh, weeks. I'm also... A uh, huge fan of that so far, but not to not to derail, not to derail because we still have to watch two more episodes of that that have yet to be released. Right. So yeah, so I'd probably give this like an A minus. Would you? Yeah. Yeah, that's I enjoyed good. it. Maybe a B plus. Yeah. Like right on right on that line. Yeah. I uh, I think as far as courtroom dramas, it's good. Yeah. I would also like to recommend anybody who has not seen Mark Rylance in the adaptation of Wolf Hall. Please find that on Netflix or Amazon or like PBS.com or wherever because he is excellent in it. He plays a, uh, oh crap, he he plays a lawyer for Henry VIII. So it's a period piece, which means Daltz is like, I'm out. Um, but yeah. If they got wigs on, I'm out. He's also a lawyer in this. I don't know if we mentioned that or not. With a terrible wig. With a like, pretty bad comb over wig. Like whoever did that hair piece should just be taken out back and flogged because so it was really bad. They One of the articles that the uh, research crack team, I mean the crack research team. 
We haven't been drinking, listener. I promise. <laughs> this is the way I always talk. Uh, they uh, gave us a great article comparing the photos of the actors and then the photos of the real people and the comb over for Mark Ranalance's character, uh, Kunstler, uh, was even worse in real life. So yeah, I think that was a pretty accurate uh, comb over wig. Yeah, that poor guy. His poor wife, like, if she ever came to visit him on the set in pre-pandemic <laughs> times, would have been like, ooh. <laughs> so you would tell me if I had a bad comb over, right? Yes. Okay. Or a comb back? Because yeah. I, I tend to comb back right now. <laughs> I'm doing all I can to cover the bald spot. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do the Trump thing and then right. have like the spray tan like, okay. and we're good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, good. Because I was going to get a spray tan for my birthday, but <laughs> to surprise you. You don't know what birthday Santa got you. <laughs> you don't know. Here's a gift card to glowing dreams. I don't know. What's the... Are spray tan places even still allowed to operate during a pandemic? Oh, that seems golly. like it would be... Even in non-pandemic times, like a hygiene issue. So, and do you have to wear your mask? So, like, you get sprayed, and then you got mask spray on your like, oh, a, right. like a ghost. Oh, yeah. Or like you used to just have like the goggles, right. and now you've got like the mask as well. Ooh, yeah. You look like uh, Mr. Leahy on Trailer Park Boys. Well, you should probably be wearing a mask in one of those booths, anyways, because like the spray stuff will go in your nose, right? And yeah, won't that be I, gross? I, yeah. Okay, so if you want to hear more enlightening banter like this, you can find... Why wouldn't you? You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Google Play, IMDb. Yeah. We are on Ghana if you're in India, and we are also on Amazon Music, so please find us there. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts so other people can find us as well. If you want to let us know what you think about our spray tan musings, <laughs> you want to correct the record because clearly neither one of us has ever had a spray tan, Right. you can email us at cocoandalts at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at cocoandalts, and you can also also find Find us on the interwebs at cocoandalts.com for our reviews of things that we don't talk about on the podcast. So thanks for joining us, listener. We appreciate your support. Share us, like us, tell your friends about us, support us, send us money. Uh, for another episode of the podcast, I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dalts. <laughs>